Greetings, everyone. So I'm Robert Kennedy, president of the Tennessee Valley Stellar Corporation. You can find us at uh, www.stellarcorp.tv. I would like to dedicate this talk to two persons who cannot be here. One is my late father, third assistant engineer on the nuclear ship Savannah. He appreciated big metal at the cutting edge of science and engineering. I think he would have liked this uh, meeting we're having here today. And the other is all of our mutual friend, the late great John Wharton, who was in on the geoengineering from the very beginning, 21 years ago. So welcome one and all. We are talking about geoengineering. So let's get right into it. What's the problem? Well, problem simple. Governments worldwide have shown, shown themselves pretty much incapable of working together effectively to deal with climate change. Now, if we cannot kick our carbon habit as individuals or nation states, then uh, we should and can deploy a sunshade in space to cool the planet sometime hence. Now, such a shade craft will be huge, the size of Texas, and it'll take decades to build. In order to have this capability, this technology ready by mid-century, which is about the time the Boffin say that we better start doing something, we can buy a long-term option of starting te technology development right now. Thank you. So um, I was the lead author the lead author on a 2013 article in Journal of the British Interplanetary Sci um, uh, Society on the design and construction of a large shade craft that we dubbed Dyson Dots. And anyone who wants a copy of this, just contact me by email offline, the K3 at stellarcorp.tv. Um, this article, uh, nine years ago, remains the leading authority in the field. We did a mass budget and economic cost benefit calculation. And it's, even the Germans say it hasn't been improved and they use it. And when Germans say you're credible, that's, you know, you're, you're good. In addition, in my day job, I've been doing green energy all over the world for interesting people all over the world. Um, helping uh, scientists and engineers in developing economies build stable teams, keyword stable teams, to develop their own renewable energy resources for their benefit over the long term. And these experiences have led me to pursue this goal by starting technology development on a prototype. We have created the Tennessee Valley Stellar Corporation, a nonprofit entity to cooperatively design and launch prototype shade craft called Dyson Pico Dots. The project will operate at a stable radiated, radiation levitated orbit. That means where light does the propelling near the sun earth Lagrange point magic gravitational point. These pico dots are based on CubeSat technologies and are newly accessible to small organizations. That's why now. Why we didn't do it in 2013? Because the necessary elements didn't exist yet in 2013. But now they do. Three things have emerged which are transforming the world, especially in this, in this 
thought space. One, a cube sat is by saying a cube, 10 centimeters on a side, four inches. The important thing is it's a physical application programming interface, henceforth referred to as API. There's another API you can see on the slide in front of you, the second picture, the shipping container, which has physically transformed the world, arguably, more than chips or the internet have. Because anywhere a four-wheel truck can get, the entire world economy can reach out and touch you via a shipping container. Now, in CubeSats, there's two forms of standardization or interoperability. There's above, which means inter a common interface with a launcher. So every rocket in the world now expects that they may have a CubeSat as a ride-along passenger, and there's a common interface that everybody knows how to deal with. It's much like having a plug that you know is going to go into the wall to run your device. And then there's downward um, standardization, which is to say in the CubeSat market, um, a marketplace has exist with numerous pre-built off-the-shelf components. So the great thing about standardization is it alleviates the pain of dealing with interface issues so that the, in fact, I'll take a brief aside. Dr. Allison mentioned at the top of the call how it is that uh, scientists and engineers have been, course, been forced to become videographers and learn all, this, all these video presenting tricks. That is an example of interface pain. So the great thing about standardization is it removes the pain from the interface matters and allows the team to concentrate on the stuff they're good at and the stuff that's novel in their mission, which might be a small fraction of the mass of the spacecraft, but it's where, it's, it's where the purpose of the spacecraft is. CubeSats have enabled the creation of things and capabilities in space that are directly interacted with by people on the ground. For example, planet.com operates an array of about 100 CubeSats, about the size of a quart of milk, a little larger, with a telescope in them, 100, that essentially do a line scan of planet Earth every 24 hours, and then they make this available to absolutely everybody who's willing to pay a modest fee. Recently, open source intelligence is being relied on in the war in Ukraine by their citizens, soldiers, publicly available open source intelligence, including publicly available synthetic aperture radar sats, which provide an all weather imaging capability, photo reconnaissance capability in near real time to the citizen soldiers fighting on the ground. Which is changing the world. That war is not going the way anyone expected just two and a half months ago. Now our Dyson Pico Dot project, it's, it's but one mission of a space program of the Tennessee Valley Stellar Corp Space Program, or Stellar Corp for short, because that's a mouthful. The program is, our program is cooperative, not authoritarian. It may be possible to build a small satellite uh, with a small team in an in a authoritarian manner, but 30, 40, 50 years from now, when the human race needs to build an actual full-scale Dyson dot the size of Texas or school of them the size of Texas, that is absolutely not possible without cooperation among the entire human race. Now, as techies here in Silicon Valley know, especially at Stanford University, one model of social cooperation that has proven itself over a long time is Linux, which is an enduring open source project ubiquitously embedded even in proprietary closed corporations. So whatever their external product line is that they're selling to the public, 
what they actually run inside is Linux because it works. Sometime between the 1970s and now, we went, our community went from centralized mainframes to smartphones with apps that can do anything a user could possibly want, wish, or imagine from anywhere in the world. This represents an absolute phase change in one's ability to mobilize resources and bring them there on a project, a surprisingly small amount of resources. So the Tennessee Stellar Corp will inspire this enormous untapped resource around the world of regular but technically proficient people who have, who have demonstrated the, abil um, the ability to work effectively remotely, contrary to traditional management expectations because of the pandemic. That's turned management wisdom upside, um, not just upside, upside down. And I can tell you from personal experience, many corporations have made irreversible decisions to capture the economic benefits of that downsizing their commercial real estate and having everyone work from home. And in fact, centers of excellence for space exploration have emerged completely outside of traditional power centers, you know, the giant bureaucracies and the giant multi-billion contractors. One example that our organization is quite familiar with is the RANSAP project, RAM SAT, for Robertsville Middle School, which was conceived, designed, fabricated, assembled, launched, deployed, and is now successfully being operated at this minute by 12-year-olds in our at the Robertsville Middle School in our town of Oak Ridge, Tennessee. This is the youngest team in history to ever execute a satellite project of any kind. And if you want a metric, it took them four years and $70,000 US and a couple of gifted mentors and one shop teacher who was a real visionary. So this is just an extraordinary downward push. The third major emergence, especially in the last five years, is pretty much a universal disenchantment, disappointment with elites, with elites ability to run things. And if it depresses you to read the newspaper, no, you're not helpless. You can help yourself by working with us. Institutions are dysfunctional. I mean, after having pleas like uh, young Miss Thunberg from Sweden um, repeatedly explain, tell the world that they we're in bad shape and wish witnessing that dysfunction and failure of the power structure to respond to climate change, people should know they can take effective action for themselves by cooperating with us to solve the climate problem by building this basic demonstration capability that later on can be scaled up among many other missions in space along the way to that. Stellar Corp will help you do that. Um, so at this point, I'm gonna dive into some details on how we're actually doing what we're doing, what we've already done and what we're gonna do in the future. So we've made an early focus on communications technology and mobile platforms uh, because that's something we can reach immediately. So everybody's familiar with the ham radio community and drones and such, which I'll get into in a second. So the idea 
is to build community and do real technology development, but on the ground and in the air before you have to do it in space. Because I will tell you, having built green energy teams all over the world with all kinds of interesting people, the hard part of the equation has always been the human beings, getting the human beings to work together in a stable way. You solve that, you can do anything. So there's a variety of pl platforms that can be used, fixed, you know, mobile and sessile, fixed and moving, towers, which are fixed, drones that move, balloons of various kinds, tethered balloons, tropospheric balloons, free-flying stratospheric balloons, balloons with rockets in them called raccoons, and after all that, satellites. The idea is to leverage the ham radio community, which we have done, um, all of us have either gotten or are getting our tickets as they're called, leverage the ham radio community, which has a century long tradition of public service and cooperation and ample spectrum allocation all over the place so we can learn technical uh, um, communication skills and building hardware. You might ask, well, there's loads of ham radio clubs already. How are you any different? Well, we're leveraging a concept which in the big science world or the ap academic world, kind of a wonky term called user facilities. We're developing a network of user facilities. Almost anything can be a user facility. A user facility is something physical that you have that would be useful to other people. So wouldn't it be great if you could use theirs and they could use yours? So you, that's how you build cooperation and a network of mutual expectation and performance. At a higher level than the physical user facilities of using each other's existing resources, is the joint engineering of novel, of new facilities, new capabilities that as we get into our space program, we discover we need. And finally, the magic thing about cooperation is the sharing of budgets. And there are many kinds of budgets, social budgets, people, money, people's time, technical budgets, mass, power, volume, link budget in the, uh, in the communication scheme, learning to share a limited resource. So we're building this user base, this base of users, starting locally and regionally and extending beyond the, around the world within a few years because number one, we want to have users on our own spacecraft and we wanna get more people working that way. And by doing this for years and getting people trained up, we build the personnel pipeline to execute, to create a space ecosystem, which I'll talk about in a minute, space ecosystem. So again, the geoengineering demonstrator is not the only thing we intend to do. Other people might wanna do other things. And when you cooperate, you let other people achieve their dreams while they help you achieve your dreams. So the reason that the user facilities and the network of user facilities needs to extend worldwide is locally, you can talk to a drone within a hundred meters or you know, a kilometer. You can talk to a balloon within tens of kilometers. To talk to a satellite, it's a good idea to have people in every time zone around the Earth because that's what even a low Earth orbit satellite goes all around the world. So every time zone sees every part of the sky eventually. Now, recall what I said about CubeSats and a market of pre-engineered pre commercial off-the-shelf components. Now, because we're developing, one of our long-term goals is this radiation-levitated craft. 
no one has ever demonstrated a pure, pure solar sail control the attitude in space, ever. If you're thinking of the Japanese Icaros, they're the only ones to have come close, but that, that was not predominantly a solar sail. That was a heavy thing with a heavy payload. They did get some propulsion from the solar sail part and they controlled their attitude admirably, but a light gossamer sheet, no one's ever managed to control the attitude. That's never been done. So on our way to that challenging mission, we're going to run into things that are not commercially available off the shelf. But we have provided for a new technology development program. And indeed, in the course of starting up Stellar Corp, we've already conceived multiple inventions, a number of useful devices, which we're pretty sure don't exist anywhere else. So uh, back to the CubeSat for a second. For, for items that um, are not commercially off the shelf, we've begun this collaborative ecosystem for new technology development and an ecosystem where our own satellites are in themselves user facilities in the sense that we can provide, just like people provide us rides into space, we can provide secondary rides for the people who want to ride with us. Remember, a CubeSat is about this big. Well, there are these things called patch sats, which are chip sats, about five by five centimeters on a side. So if you look at a 10 centimeter cube, you have room for 16 or by four, by four, by four, 16 ride-along chipsets. Um, there's, there's a guy at uh, Carnegie Mellon who's flown chipsets free-flying. So people could ride, send their chipset to ride with us and do their experiment in space, and achieve their dreams, and we'll help them do that. Um, getting back to the solar sail for a minute, we, we anticipate in a um, these gossamer things, the attitude control, that deploying a sheet of material is actually going to be near the heart of the technical risk of the um, of uh, Stellar Corp and especially the uh, Dyson dot program, Dyson Pico dot program. So where are we? Well, um, we've been pre-funding early experiments with actual user facilities. We, we own hardware, we, we've flown it. If you'll notice, I had my call sign at the top of the talk and there's a device flying around in Virginia, the drone with some, um, I mean, it's a simple demonstration, but you can see this anywhere on the web when it's turned on. We've uh, uh, working with um, partners. We, we're flying payloads on balloons. So Stellar Corp has been in organizational development for about two years and work, working out the, you know, the timeline and the broad shape of the mission. And we're now in the phase of raising money. So how can you get involved? There are specific things we need. There are specific ways for you to get involved. More people and more money, of course, goes without saying, but um, a specific need is to acquire and share space on towers where you know, cell phones have their packages on towers, radio stations have their packages on towers. Ham radio people have packages on towers all over the country. So tower space is valuable. So it'd be great to acquire and share tower space with each other so that this community can learn the technical skills of emulation and simulation and actual physical hardware on towers, which are easy to talk to. Um, another thing you can do, get a ham radio license. And if you already have a ham radio license, be a station operator for other people who don't yet have one, but want to learn the business of commu uh, electronic communication and talking. And I, 
Uh, other than saying ham radio, I don't believe I've mentioned the word radio once in this talk because comms is a broader subject than that. Another thing you can do is to build an SDR project, software defined radio, um, to work satellite. So work with us, get involved, take charge of your lives, make a contribution to this big challenge facing the human race uh, about a half century down the road. You can do something useful now, which will lead to a small scale demonstration, much like the mRNA 10 years, uh, 20 years ago and 10 years ago became very useful to the human race in the last two years. So I will now take questions. We've got, well, actually, I'm at your disposal. I'll stay here as long as you like, but we have a, we have a good hour for questions. So um, I'll let um, Dr. Allison be the MC, and any of the uh, live in-person people, you can pose questions as well. I have some backup slides if you want you know, prettier pictures. So go. Um, the Dyson Pico dot itself, as the word Pico indi indicates, is a 12 order of magnitude smaller demonstration of the actual device you would need to cool the planet Earth. It's the size of Texas, whereas the Pico dot is the size of your dinner. One trillion dinner tables makes Texas. But the Dyson Pico dot is within reach of a small team, thanks to the CubeSat revolution and those other things that have emerged, which means a team of about a dozen people over say five or 10 years can build the demonstrator and fly it at the relevant point in space, which is on the sunny side of the Sun Earth L1 point, prove the concept that it works, that you can operate there using purely light pressure and not consuming any fuel. So that's the key, fuel's expensive. So if you can fly there, operate there, communicate with the device there, you've proven what you need to, much like the mRNA experiment, which was 99% of the way there, all they had to do at the NIH was tweak it a little and then scale it up by 10 billion. So that's the idea. Provide the proof of concept to show that it can work, and if necessary, decades in the future, you know, in place of in case of fire, break glass. There is a capability, but if we wait to fifty years in the future and say, "Oh, we got to build solar sails," how are they going to ramp up to something the size of Texas in that amount of time? So, as Dr. Allison would say, we don't have the luxury of time. We do have a few decades to get this done, but we don't have decades to waste. But these remarkable emergences, CubeSats and small cooperative projects and people working from home, that has shown we can get started productively now on this long-term technology demonstration demonstration program. And it's, it's a practical program, which will lead to a useful end result a decade hence, which may provide the baseline, the basis of an intervention, a global intervention, three decades hence. And even more important, it will build community, technical, cooperative, community around the world for executing other projects that haven't been thought of. For example, if I may elaborate, I said at the top, governments are incapable, have proven themselves incapable of dealing with climate change. There are other transnational global threats that are also not being dealt with. Marine plastic pollution, the collapse of the ocean fisheries. In our field, space junk. Nobody's doing anything constructive about it. 
So that's why people are disappointed in Hillary, not to mention nuclear proliferation and all those things. Is that another question, please? Yeah, how many million years have been in the Earth? Because we've done the calculation and it's, it's about the size of Texas. A Texas is one quarter of 1% of the circular area of Earth. It may be you need 2%, which is 10 Texases. The answer is somewhere, somewhere in between. But we know from the historical record that a one quarter of 1% decline in sunlight caused the Little Ice Age in Northern Europe. That we know because it's a thing called the Maunder Minimum. Okay, and I'll illustrate the magnitude of the Maunder Minimum. Everybody knows about the solar max min cycle. Everybody knows about the solar max min cycle, which is about one thousandth of the sun's output fluctuates over an 11 year period. The easy way to visualize this is take two reams of Xerox paper, that's a thousand sheets. And it's the thickness of one sheet of paper. That's the variation. One sheet of paper on the two reams. The Maunder minimum, three sheets of paper. And we know from historical records, from parish records, from things that people kept, that the sunspot count went to zero and Europe, Northern Europe declined over two degrees Fahrenheit. And population stalled, crops failed, etc. So we know that an intervention somewhere between a quarter of a percent, perhaps as much as two percent, will do it. It will basically a rheostat that dials back global warming enough. It doesn't do anything about the carbon habit or acidification of the oceans. Some folks think it's a moral hazard to come up with a solution that gets you out of confronting your, you know, your substance abuse problem, but the, that's, that's sophistry. When you know, the house is burning down, you need, you need to act. You need to put a capability in place. Uh, Dr. Allison, can you uh, be the MC and read the uh, questions in the chat box? Yeah. While he's doing that, I'll take another question from the live audience in person. We thought about that. That's in here. So please, everyone. Can you repeat, can you repeat the question? Nobody, uh, yes. nobody on Zoom can hear. Uh, the question was, have you thought about the materials of construction of the full scale dot? Why, yes, we have. That's partly where our mass budget came from. So uh, everybody thinks aluminized mylar, but actually uh, solar radiation would uh, blast the heck out of mylar in just a few years. Um, what we do have in space, mother nature's funny. The way elements, the abundance of elements are in the cosmos, you might think, oh, aluminum would be a great thing to build this um, reflective uh, mirror out of. In fact, there's three times as much magnesium in the cosmos as there is aluminum. So if you go into space and you're har harvesting space resources and you're doing metals production, you know, reduction and fabrication, for large lightweight stuff, you're probably going to use magnesium which has got as good a strength to weight ratio as aluminum, and it's a lot more available. And either way, the lunar regolith is oxides of aluminum and oxides of mag magnesium and oxides of titanium. So there's plenty of those light middleweight metals to go around. In, well, this object that's being pictured, and uh, if you would click one more to the uh, thing the size of that object is a hundred million tons. Even a sheet of foil the size of Texas would be a hundred million tons. To lift a hundred million tons 
off of planet Earth. Well, let me put it this way. Guess, would anybody care to guess since the begin since October 4th, 1957, how much mass have human beings permanently put into space? And by permanently, I mean, I don't mean that like the space shuttle that went up and came down. I mean the stuff that they brought up and that they left there. How much mass? Take a guess. A thousand tons. We have a thousand tons. Any other guesses? Ten tons. Did you say 10 tons? Okay. Any other guesses? One ton. Okay. Well, that's a nice bracket. And is the closest? The answer is about 10,000 tons. So in 60 years, the sum total of the satellites, the deep space probes, the junk, 10,000 tons, more or less. The sheet of foil the size of Texas is 10,000 times that. 10,000 times 10,000 is 100 million. So to lift off of planet Earth in the next few decades, 10,000 times what we have lifted off in the previous 60 years seems like a stretch. I'm guessing there had there have been there have been other proposals. Uh, one proposal was for five trillion with a T things the size of a phonograph record that would be optical diffractors and steer them around a little. Now, What's the cost to raise a ton? Right now, um, $10,000 a kilogram. And it's, it's, yeah, yeah. And if they ever get their star, whatever they call it, built, it might drop to a um, thousand. And that's just a lift. Thousand. Dr. Allison. Ton means two different things. Yeah, it's only ten percent different. Don't worry about it. We're 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 not gonna we're not gonna mess with the uh, you know anything beyond the decimal point. Then I'll take some questions by the chat box. I imagine there's quite a few. Yeah. Well, the, another reason is yeah. How would you now look? This is size of Texas is just for talking point. People to just understand the scale of the intervention. In fact, what you would do is you build many of them. The people in three decades, four decades, hence, after we have proven to them that it can be done, three or four decades hence, they uh, might build items the size of a city, which is a square kilometer or 10 square kil kilometers or maybe the size of a county, which is a thousand square kilometers. So they may, may build thousands of them and they may, may build a million of them. That's for them to decide. But the advantage of building lots of little ones is build a little, learn a little, learn by doing. And the other advantage of building lots of little ones is every little one you put up, you get an incremental, anti-climate change benefit. In other words, you don't have to wait, like unlike a power plant, say, or a nuclear power plant, you don't have to wait until this multi-billion dollar investment is complete before you see any economic benefit. By building a number of small ones and learning along the way, you generate the economic benefit pay as you go. Um, Right. One comment uh, suggests that the uh, uh, blue ice age was really due to volcanic eruptions rather than occlusion of the. Might have been a combination because the little ice age was quite harsh. Um, it lasted three, maybe four centuries. Now, one thing that would let the volcano, the volcano may have contributed. But volcanic effects don't last centuries unless the volcanic event is so huge it creates a nuclear winter. For instance, the Toba eruption off the island of either Java or Sumatra 74,000 years ago 
created a thousand year nuclear weapon. It wasn't actually nuclear, but a thousand years. And it almost took out the human race. In fact, it killed every human being who managed to walk out of Africa before 74,000 years ago, they all died. So we had to walk out of Africa again. So Toba did that. Snowball art, that's like 700 million years ago. That's the, uh, the Devonian. There was a period 50 million years ago when the earth was quite hot, even after the dinosaurs got killed, the earth was still hot. And then um, in the Arctic Ocean, some, some um, patch like duckweed, but it's actually a tiny fern called Azola. Now, the one thing about the Arctic Ocean that's interesting is it's, land, it's essentially landlocked. It's hardly connected to the world oceans at all. Just look at a, turn a globe and look at the nose. You'll see the Arctic Ocean is almost completely surrounded and all the major continental rivers north of like the 45th parallel flow north and dump into it which means the Arctic Ocean is very nutrient rich and it's cold. And what happens with cold? Cold salt water sinks, right? And fresh water sits on top. So you had kind of warm, brackish, nutrient rich, fresh water on top, fed by all the rivers flowing in. So then this little weed got started and it spread over the Arct Arctic Ocean in a flash. It would cover it in a year and then northern winter would happen and the weed would die, the little ferns would die and they would sink to the bottom into the ooze. And the next summer, it would happen again and again and again. And in less than 1 million years, the Earth's concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere went from about 3,500 parts per million. It dropped 80% to about 700 parts per million, and we have never gone back since. So 49 million years ago, the Earth had a permanent transition to a cooler Earth. And to put the 700 in perspective, we passed 400 million not too long ago, 400 per million, and you know we're headed, headed back up. So this little insignificant little plant fundamentally change the planetology, planetology and geology of Earth. It's down there in the record. It's one reason that there's so many uh, petrochemical resources in the Arctic. It's why people drill there, because all the stuff is in the ooze and got turned into oil. Oh. Wait, I, I was under the impression that it's pretty industrial looking at like 360 parts. No, no, actually pre-industrial was, I'm going to say 280. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I, I don't know what happened to the 700 down to the 300, but you know. Right, so uh, uh, asked, um, he thought the uh, pre-industrial level was 350 parts per million, and I correct him. It's close. You were only off 20 percent. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, what was the time uh, of the uh, project in space? What was the lifetime of the project in space? And do you intend to uh, uh, Oh, why don't I answer the first one and you figure out. Okay, the, well, the last part's easy. No. <laughs> what would be the point? Right, it takes propellant and, you know, no. Oh. It, it, yeah. No, it'd be pointless to bring it back to Earth. Um, so the lifetimes. Uh, we've, we've envisioned a stepwise private space program. Once we're well on the way of building a community with terrestrial assets, fixed and mobile, remember towers, drones, balloons. The next step, like 12 year olds in our town did, is small CubeSats and Leo, right? To prove the team can produce a satellite, 
interface with the bureau, deal with the bureaucracy. Because if, if it's space, you've got to learn how to deal with bureaucracy, which a lot of open source movements don't know how to do, don't have the patience to do. So that's another way we're different. So small CubeSats in Leo, but these CubeSats wouldn't be just a stunt. They would demonstrate some principles. For instance, flying two at a time, you would demonstrate formation flying. If you can get far enough up in LEO, you might be able to generate enough solar propulsive force that using a really good clock, you could measure the difference in velocity. It's, it's not much. For example, that Japanese project um, 12 years ago that flew, the students built it in two and a half years for $20 million, which is actually completely remarkable for an interplanetary mission. It's, it's astounding. They flew this spacecraft, which was about the size of this room. They flew it to Venus. Now, mostly the spacecraft hitched a ride on another Japanese interplanetary mission. And that's where it got 99% of its Delta V. But the straight up solar part, over eight months, that solar sail, generated about 100 meters per second of delta V, but it took them eight months. So in LEO, you'd be looking at you know, much smaller, so you need really good measurement. Uh, there are other things we can do in LEO, uh, communications, uh, testing non-RF communications, um, uh, uh, formation flying. Uh, one Potential is what we call the Van Allen Express, which when we're done with the experiment, you have the little thing raise its orbit on purpose and fly through the Van Allen belt and kill itself, but everybody's getting telemetry to see because nobody voluntarily flies into the Van Allen. I mean, on purpose, but, you know, it's sort of like a mine going, uh, um, demining a field by, you know, stomping. Geo, there are things we can do now. In geo, you could almost certainly start measuring the delta V from solar propulsion and demonstrate formation flying and interface with bureaucracy because, once again, geo is extremely valuable real estate. It's like having an office building on El Camino Real. So, you know, everybody's going to get involved. It's, it's a, it's a sensitive area and geo is a place where we can hitch a ride to in the beginning of our program we're going to be you know as the germans say machen auto stop we're going to be hitching rides maybe later on we'll have our own launchers conceivable not impossible beyond geo though beyond geo there aren't you can't get free rides. So if you want to go to the vicinity of the moon, this is called cislunar space. Between the Earth's hill sphere and the moon, it's called cislunar space. And if you want a ride, you have to pay somebody else who's already going there for commercial or military reasons. And the cost is $300,000 per kilogram, which is, Remember, those students in Oak Ridge built their entire satellite for $70,000, a one kilogram satellite. So that's pretty stiff. And if you want to land on the moon, million dollars a kilogram. And if you want to go to the Sun-Earth Lagrange point or the Earth Trojans, presently you have to hitch a ride and that's going to set you back a cool million dollars per kilogram. And if you can think of some other clever way to do it, sure, but, but that clever way, no matter how you do it, you might have a team of engineers who's doing something clever, but guess what? You have to pay a team of engineers to sit at their computers for two, three, four years. Guess what? You're back at a million. It's like the, thir it's like the laws of thermodynamics. You, know? you can't win, you can't break even, and you can't leave the game. So, but, one thing that has emerged in the cubes, CubeSat space are these small engines about yay big. 
the size of two CubeSats put together. And the great thing about such a small engine is if you have a large enough propellant tank, and with this engine, with a small engine and enough propellant, and it's very high performance, uh, it's uh, two, 2,000 seconds uh, at least. The great thing about this engine is it offers the possibility to get a small payload, our payload, up to where it needs to be by itself. That's phenomenal. That has not been done before. So imagine now, now everybody knows you can hitch a ride into LEO, easy peasy. NASA has a huge program for that, you know, the CubeSat program. They will give you the ride for free if you organize your team a certain way and prove you're not going to waste NASA's time. If you show that you're running things, which the Oak Ridge students did, NASA gives you the ride, and that's worth 100 or 200 grand. It's great. Everybody can get to Leo, hitch a ride to Leo. And some people can hitch a ride to Geo. But anywhere else, it's hard. So imagine what it's going to do for small team science and engineering and technology development of small teams of people of 10 to 20 dedicated people can get into a region of space that has never been gotten to by a small team before something that JPL has been doing for 60 years, now being done by a dozen people in a, something barely larger than a garage. Imagine what's gonna happen. Well, you don't have to imagine very hard because here we are in Silicon Valley, which partly was started by two guys in a garage, right? Yep. That's the story. It's a good, it's a good uh, origin story. So we have another question. Uh, what, Thank you for coming. What about the risk of doing wet control? If you could get it to uh, work uh, with the government's mechanism, what, what if the uh, control is, is lost and so forth? Well, the premise of our program and of our nonprofit is that governments ain't doing the job and there's, there's, there's a serious problem that's not being addressed effectively or in a timely way because governments are not cooperating. I mean, governments can certainly command the resources. They could if they wanted to, but apparently they don't, you know, partly because they're beholden to unrepresentative special interests. So smaller teams of people now have the ability to make contributions, improve technology that will ultimately be scaled up by a very large cooperation at some point in the future, decades hence. But we're providing both a technical demonstration, like this idea technically, it's feasible, it can work, we've proven the principle, and we're providing a model of grassroots open source, non-proprietary cooperation based on community and mutual expectation at a human scale, which would be salubrious. Well, think of Linux. How is Linux governed? How is, how is, a, how is a open source community project like Linux governed? How is the internet created in the first place with the Internet Engineering Task Force? Was volunteers got together and agreed on standards of behavior. They agreed on technical standards and whatever. Bottom-up govern governance is perfectly possible. You don't need top-down bureaucratic governance. That's 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 a relic of the agricultural revolution when you know kings and priests controlled the grain output because those were the only people who knew how to write. Or the early industrial era where everything was mass production, mass production lines and uh, tailorism at the Watertown arsenal. Now everything was mass production. You need armies of workers, you know, being actual armies. You know, cooperation has always had two broad styles, both called cooperation. One style of cooperation is called 
collaboration. And that's where people who are relatively even in the org chart all pitch in to help out on common tab because they all know a little about the overall task that's to be done. That's a very flat pyramid. And then the other style of cooperation, perfectly valid, is called coordination. And coordination is where, well, if they, you do A, then you do B, then you do C, you do D. That's more like a traditional factory, which is also a valid way of organizing things. And for a space project, you would need both. And at the front end of our nonprofit, of Stellar Corp, we are absolutely collaborative. Everybody knows a little bit about something and we all pitch in on what's to be done. Later on, when you're building the bird and especially when you're interfacing with bureaucracy and making sure the paperwork's correct, that becomes more like coordination. Things have to happen in a stepwise way. So the front obviously is more democratic and the latter is somewhat more authoritarian, but not more authoritarian than it has to be. By the way, I, um, I've been remiss. I believe there are several members of Stellar Corp, K3 at stellarcorp.tv. Sure. At the very beginning, yeah. K3, you know. Yeah. And, um, I think uh, um, everything here, I think we've, uh, we've touched on it. There are uh, considerations of uh, uh, a little uh, ice age and uh, uh, volcanic eruptions and correspondence, that sort of thing. But they're all things that can be dealt with offline. And I don't think really need to turn the group here. Um, what's your next, the next, uh, What's, what happens? Next? We're going to the, we're having the grand opening in early June, June 11th. So uh, anybody who wants to come, call me first, make sure it's on. Don't buy a plane ticket until I tell you to. But our plan is to have the grand opening June 11th in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. And um, we're going to the small satellite. We're doing a lot of learning this summer, going to the small satellite conference in Utah. And I'm going to be doing this talk, uh, preparing for you, Dr. Allison, has been salubrious and necessary for it. It forced us to think. So we're, ask, we're asking for money right away. And we will just continue to do that. We're, probably gonna be in proposal hell for several years, you know, investigating all these sources. We know there's private foundations. We're very much into the same vision. There's even governmental entities who, you know, we can be, we can be Sputniks, right? Fellow travelers for a while. Oh, and, and our technical work has not stopped before, long before this speech, we're already buying hardware and flying it. And we're gonna to continue to do that, all right? The whole time and in a stepwise form, greater and greater to technical sophistication. So first software defined radio and satellite emulators, which is all software, but very soon after that, physical dipoles, simulating on the ground or in the air, how an actual bird in space tumbles and its antennas are tumbling. And how do you, how do you talk to antennas that are tumbling? Well, you can make antennas tumble on a drone and learn what that behavior is and learn how to adapt to it. You can do that right now here on the ground. For example, so we have, you know, immediately we have a three year program of these staggered, you know, technical learning sub programs. We're all, we're going to be busy. Meanwhile, not losing sight of the love building the organization, 
building the website, building the means for people to share facilities fairly without favoritism and you know good standards of behavior. Point in time, do you have a time a timeline for what things are going to happen when? Yeah. Because uh, I think uh, you've uh, you alluded to the same fifty year old in the future uh, date that mm -hmm. every project is never going to change. I subscribe to. Uh, I, I I personally think that the dates of near disaster are very much closer than you well, like to think. This isn't going to take anything like 50 years. And if, if anybody's got that impression, no, no, no. Our program is 10-ish, give or take a few, right? With a three-year program right up front that we are already engaged in of community building, network building, technical capable building a user facility, getting them recruited and on board. Three years of fairly intense activity of that before engineer, starting to engineer the first bird into Leo. And that might take two years to execute. So notionally, and this is just notionally, 2027 for an asset in Leo. Might be sooner. I don't expect it to be later. Could be sooner if we get lucky. And then after that, about a year and a half to two year cadence, just like the Apollo program, build a little, learn a little, because hardware trumps all. Now, you, uh, you're, you're focused geographically around those things. That's where we're starting. And I, I would like to tell you a little story about that. Uh, Dr. Allison said, geographically, you're focused around Oak Ridge, and that was just the lead-in comment. So may I address, and then you can give me the second half of the question. Two years ago, we conceived, our original conception was, we're going to have to look all over Earth, because when I do green energy, I'm all over the Earth. And in fact, I happen to know there's some of my genius teammates from Africa are on the call. I know people all over the earth, and I certainly hope to get them involved one day as soon as possible. But we realized a year ago when we saw a bunch of 12 year olds put up a satellite, which no one had even been talking about. It was a, it was a much a surprise to me, honestly, as anyone. You don't know what you don't know. But when we realized that 12-year-olds can do this, we realized we don't have to look much beyond 30 to 100 miles from where we live. We, like all, all the resources are there, which is great because that's also the scale of the initial user facilities and sharing is on the county fragmentary state level. So that's why we're starting small, but or, I mean, limited geographic scope. But remember I said, ultimately to talk to something in space, you need eyes and ears in every time zone. So what's the second half of your question? How are you going to manage your international growth? I don't know. Satnogs does it. Satnogs is an international organization. Um, remember what I said about build a, build a little, learn a little? Managing the growth is absolutely key to any right, enterprise that's going to be successful is to handle the growth problem. One thing I do know, because we've mapped this out with labor hours and dollars, on the space program side of things, in other words, the engineering technical side of things, we've mapped out a 15 year program. And at no point does our resource burn get crazy. And the progression of satellite experiment, of satellite, um, spacecraft experiments on a, a semi-log scale proceeds uniformly without any suspicious 
like, and then a miracle happens kind of thing. It's remarkably linear on a semi-log scale over the 15 years. Yet the burn rate in terms of labor hours and dollars is not much more than plus minus a factor of two, which is fairly steady. So that means the pacing of the spacecraft construction part, the design, the engineering, and the launch and the operation, the pacing of that is um, sustainable. But a social program, the networking, that may end up growing like those Azola weeds. We may have a tiger by the tail five years hence. It could happen. Again, look at Silicon Valley. These things happen. We'll be watching. We've developed a set of metrics. The wonky word is key performance indica indicators. We heard a lot of that at uh, Ms. Ilamar. We've developed a small set of KPIs that we're tracking to watch, well, if this thing really takes off, can we, can, we, can we manage it? And just like the climate change problem, do we have personnel in place who are ready to step in and manage it? My personal ambition is to be mission director on, you know, when the bird finally gets to SEL1. And actually there was an earlier question about uh, the longevity, right? Which I didn't completely answer. We have two things that we're gonna put at SEL1, one first and one second. At SEL1 itself will be a long duration, like by long I mean decade, a station that moves a little, but can, be, can talk to when you're not having to point your radio antenna or other comms device directly at the sun. Because at the L1 point, there are these things called halo orbits where you move around, but you're still, you don't get too far away. So that object intended that it be there for a decade and serve, um, it's, it, it's, it has two importances. One is to demonstrate a little photonic propulsion, but also to be this radio test bed and experimenters prop, prop, what the amateur ham radio people call an Oscar. So a long duration Oscar at SEL1. And then following that, the true solar sail for physical reasons, I won't get into, but they're sort of, uh, Andrew, if you'll go to the uh, thing with the angles and the earth and the sun, the balance point of something levitated by radiation isn't actually at the SEL1 point. It's on the sunny side of it. In essence, physically, the radiation pushing on the sail, transferring its momentum to the sail, makes the spacecraft think that the sun has lost weight. That the sun has lost weight. If the sun were more massive, you'd go around it faster. If the sun were less massive, you would go around it slower. It's, it's in essence, it's decelerating a little bit the entire time in orbit. So physically it's equivalent to if the sun weighs a little bit less. And that is why it's able to stay on the inside lane of the freeway but never get ahead of you. Like a, a car on the freeway that was on the inside lane on a curve gets ahead of you, just like planets do. But with radiation be using light, you can slow yourself down a little bit and keep pace, keep lock with somebody further out. So that's, that's the culmination of that particular satellite program, the one that's aimed at demonstrating the capability for climate change. And that's 10 years, probably no sooner than 10 years, 15 years maximum, which still leaves people of the future 25 more years 
to take that and do their thing, which is scale it up. Not just build copies, but just having that principle in mind, like having PCR in mind, you know, we now know how to do all these wonderful things genetically. So it's to prove that capability. And then they have 25 or so years to do the scale up, which they should do, they should be able to do. The internet grew by that order over that period of time. Any more questions? Um, one person wanted to know if you uh, looked at the Planetary Society solar scale, scale uh, uh, yeah. project. Yeah. Your comment? Yes, uh, the Planetary Society is a remarkably flat organization. And um, they are definitely more toward the collaborative end of the cooperation scale than the coordination end. So, and the other thing they have is a extraordinary amount of patience because that solar sail is about the mm, fifth or sixth time they try to get a solar sail into orbit or a cooperative space mission of some kind. They used to work with the Russian space agency all the time. And every single one of those missions came to naught through you know, force majeure. Uh, a little launcher went bad. Somebody pushed the wrong button, whatever. I mean, they, those folks have learned to live with disappointment, yet not lose sight of their mission and they keep going. It's, it's, it's really admirable. So they, they finally got something in space, which by the way, it's CubeSat based. Um, Tumbles, but I mean, they didn't. Like, okay, we got a solar thing into space, so check. Now to control it, that's that's going to be hard. That requires very serious mathematics. I'm not sure a very flat organization is going to come up with that. That sounds more academic to me, which is definitely not flat. Well, the, the folks is long now as a project to build a 10,000 year clock. Mm -hmm. And the big problem with that is not the mechanics so much as the people to maintain it. And the same problem exists here. Uh, this is a long-term project if it uh, ends up being uh, the size of Texas. And does this mean that uh, part of your, uh, your uh, project is uh, how do you build something to manage well, a project for the long term? We have a fine example in current, not separated by a vast amount of time in history. I offer you the example of the Dutch dike builders. The Dutch have been saving their lives by engineering their landscape to save their lives, literally. If, if anyone's ever heard of Doggerland, I'll talk about that in a minute. But, you know, the whole North Sea area used to actually be occupied by people until the seas rose. So the Dutch, for 800, maybe even a thousand years, have been cooperating on building dikes to save their lives, building dikes. And they have continued this cooperation. They have maintained their mission. They have maintained their technical focus. They have maintained their personal pipeline across eight, maybe 10 centuries, despite all these changes of governance that the actual Dutch nation went through. Holland at one point was part of the Spanish empire. They've been a republic. They've been a, like a senatorial republic. They've been a monarchy. They've been every kind of thing. Yet the remarkable thing is that the technical mission and the technical society continued unabated. So that is, and of course the Dutch are among the most collaborative people on earth. So that is absolutely a long-term example, you know, in the interstellar field, for example, where missions might go a few hundred years, you're gonna have to build institutions that maintain focus, technical focus, and stay on the job generation after generation after generation. Well, it's been done. And they're not the only one, but they're very much the most on point one because they do it 
to cope with a hostile climate and not die. Do you have a question? Check one more here in the chat. No, I don't think anything here is not better handled. Um, you know, thank you very much. Thank you for the benefit of your time.